Okay, thanks, Lisa, and good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good Wednesday evening. And today we're going to talk about dentistry beyond the teeth. Uh, so traditionally, what we've learned in dental school focuses on the gums and on the teeth themselves. And what we're going to talk about today is comprehensive diagnosis, comprehensive care in dentistry, looking beyond the teeth, but mainly from uh, within the context of utilizing 3D imaging for uh, different structures that can tell us about what's going on in and around the oral cavity. So let's take it away. And uh, these are all my qualifications. I'm not going to uh, read this long list off for you tonight. Um, but you do have my email address on the bottom right. That's my office in Conway, South Carolina. Uh, I do have a private practice. I've been there since 1992. Uh, I have three associates that work with me. Uh, I also have a sleep and breathing center uh, where we do airway management and TMJ. Uh, you can also visit catapulteducation.com if you'd like to learn more about me or my courses. And uh, with that said, uh, let's go ahead and move along. I'm going to do a little bit of promo here before we get started. Um, so I don't know how many programs uh, most of you have been to through Catapult. Uh, but we have now initiated a new part of Catapult called Catapult Live, where we're going to be doing live symposiums and even a, a long-term learning continuum. And so we have this lecture coming up in Nashville, if you like some of what you hear tonight. And if you've liked what you've heard from other Catapult speakers, we invite you to come to Nashville on May the 10th. That's just a couple of weeks away, but we've got a few seats left. If, uh, if you'd like to get $60 off from the tuition, which is very inexpensive to start with, just use my name as a promo code and we'll give you that early tuition fee just because you are on tonight. Uh, so you can get more information on that where it says scan me. You can hold your phone up to that or just go to Catapult Education and uh, to our website uh, where you'll get more information on that uh, continuum and on the symposium. And uh, again, that's going to be a Nashville, should be a, a whole lot of fun. Um, so I do want to give some disclosure, uh, saying that as Catapult uh, members, we participate in a lot of different product reviews every year. Uh, we do that so that we can stay at the forefront of all the latest materials and techniques. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are as up-to-date as possible. We help a lot of these manufacturers bring new products uh, to the forefront. We actually help them in the development stages, and we find uh, that in many of these product reviews, we develop relationships with these companies. And very often these companies, uh, as we develop these relationships, will be generous enough to help sponsor some of our programs. And tonight's program is uh, being sponsored by Prexion. Uh, they are an absolutely amazing cone beam imaging company. Uh, we're going to be talking about them a little bit tonight. Uh, so that is my disclosure. Uh, but please know I do not get any funds or any fees for any sales that occur as a result of any of my lectures. Uh, I happen to be a Prexion owner and user, and so many of the perspectives you'll hear tonight are from my personal experience, and I will not talk about anything I do not use or endorse within my own practice. So uh, with that said, where is Conway, South Carolina? Where am I coming from? We're just about 15 miles north of Myrtle Beach. Uh, nice little town. We have a river that runs through there. And, uh, and we're also home of the 2016 College World Series champions, uh, Coastal Carolina University. So that's kind of our claim to fame down here, other than having really good weather most of the time, except when we're having hurricanes. So let's get started. First message I want to give you is that sometimes in practice, split happens. 
This is actually a patient that showed up at my office. This was only a couple of years after I had started. Uh, back in 1992, this patient presented. I had done the root canal. I had put the post in this bicuspid. I put a screw in it. Why? Because that's what I was taught to do in dental school. And so uh, in dentistry, the one thing that I've come to learn is that if you minimize risk, split happens less. And in this case, had I been smart enough to realize that putting a large post in a very small rooted tooth is going to increase the likelihood for fracture, had I realized that I didn't have uh, enough uh, tooth structure to grab onto with the crown, I'd have been smarter. I'd have put an implant in. I'd, I'd have recommended that the patient have the tooth out because uh, in this particular case, we would have known statistically that the likelihood was better that the patient would have a uh, or not have an emergency had they done the implant. So a lot of the perspective that I'm gonna be speaking to you from tonight is about reducing risk, about minimizing risk. This is actually a concept that was taught to me by Dr. John Coyce. Uh, as I am a graduate and mentor at the Coyce Center, this has become a key principle in my practice is, how do I keep my patients out of the chair? That's how I'm talking to my patients. How do I give them a treatment plan? How do I offer them a solution that keeps them out of my dental chair for the longest amount of time or gives them the best chance at least of staying out of the dental chair. So the typical diagnosis when someone comes in like this in South Carolina, we call that a broke tooth, not a, not a cracked tooth or a broken tooth. They'll come in and say that's a broke tooth. But it's not really about what has happened. Really what's important here is why it has happened. Because if we can figure out why this catastrophic failure occurred, then we know ways to prevent that in the future. So it's not about the what, it's about the why. You're gonna hear that throughout this presentation. Minimizing risk begins with a comprehensive diagnosis. So it starts with understanding medical problems, functional problems, and we also know that minimizing risk, um, sometimes we, we fail to do that because we fear what it will cost the patient. In other words, you know, if I offer them the best treatment, maybe it'll cost them too much. We also sometimes fear uh, our, our own costs. So perhaps we need a 3D image, perhaps we need code and beam imaging, um, but the uh, cost of getting started with cone beam imaging is what is inhibiting us. Uh, these things will all get us in trouble and they all inhibit comprehensive diagnosis. We also tend to fear informed consent, which means telling a patient that we can do something for them, but that there may be inherent risks in the treatment that they are requesting and that our treatment, our suggested treatment, is the one that reduces their risk the most, and that, you know, it's not my way or the highway. If we recommend a crown and the patient says, absolutely can't afford it, do I tell them that I can't remove their caries? No, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not turning patients away. But what I will tell them is, is the crown is the indicated procedure, and we know that once the tooth is filled uh, to a degree where it's more than one third of the width of the tooth that it only takes half the force to fracture it. And so if anything happens after we do that filling, the risk will be their patients. It will not be my risk. So in that case, we'll say to them, you know, just understand this is your compromise. This is your risk. Again, we're wanting to understand not just what is wrong, but why it went wrong in the first place so that we can help patients prevent problems in the future. So um, when we minimize risk, we wanna do these three things. We wanna increase positive outcomes for the patient by performing procedures that are proven to be the most successful 
in a given condition. We also want to increase positive outcomes for the dentist by reducing negative outcomes, meaning that we don't want to have as many of those episodes where split happens. Because when split happens, the patient is not happy. And of course, it ruins the dentist schedule because we're going to tell that patient if they have a problem that we are willing to see them. Uh, and, and that's all part of uh, being a reputable dentist is making yourself available for the patients who have been good to you. But here's the most important thing. It's allowing patients to own their own risks based on a comprehensive diagnosis of their disease and informed consent, meaning that we are willing to explain all risks to the patient, good, bad, and indifferent. So the patient needs to be made aware of everything. And I think this is one of the places that we don't do as good of a job as the medical profession does. They have no problem telling somebody that they could die from a very small procedure, yet we're afraid to tell a patient that there's a 7% chance that the nerve will die after we prep a tooth for a crown. So when the patient comes back needing a root canal, if I've told them that, they said, well, you said there was a low chance this could happen, it happened. If we don't tell them that, then the patient comes back and says, what? And they say, doc, you must have nicked the nerve, something like that must have happened, you must have done something wrong because now I need a root canal. So two different ways that, that this can all uh, occur in your office, I'm gonna take the road of minimizing risk and giving um, very good informed consent to my patients so that no patient comes back and we have split happening less. Now, what does this require? This requires data. Where is that data gonna come from? Well, let's talk about the data in just a second. We also have to have a diagnosis, which has to begin with the end in mind. So we have to have data, we have to have an accurate diagnosis, and so in order to get that, we need knowledge. Where does that knowledge come from? The knowledge comes from events like this, from, from paying attention at, at uh, webinars, from going to uh, continuums like uh, over at the Coyce Center, that's John Coyce there, um, people like Bob Garrity, who are legends in orthodontics, that's Mark Piper and Jim McKee. I studied under all of these people. And so knowledge is not something we just leave dental school with. Knowledge is something that we have to keep chasing down after we get out of dental school, and you guys are doing that now. So part of that knowledge that, that I've attained uh, through the COIS Center was understanding that we have to manage risk for uh, at least five areas of the human body when we are performing a proper examination and diagnosis in dentistry. So we need to understand the medical history. We need to understand uh, the patient's cosmetic concerns. We need to understand function. And then finally, we need to understand the teeth and the gums, biomechanical concerns and periodontal concerns. Well, dental school does a great job on the biomechanical and the periodontal where they don't do such a great job is on the medical history, on cosmetics, and on function. That's really where we all need to understand more how these three things play into not just our exam, but our comprehensive diagnosis and our treatment planning. So you'll notice that I put the teeth and gums last, and that's for a very particular reason. It's because that's what I understand really well. That's the thing that I have the most education in. Now, what I had to chase down after dental school was learning more about medicine, learning more about cosmetics, learning more about function, about the TMJ, about bites. And what most dentists don't realize is that most of our failures don't come from problems with the teeth and problems with the gums. Most of our restorative failures actually come from the first three, from mistakes that are made in not paying attention to how the medical history affects the, uh, affects the uh, oral cavity, how the oral cavity affects the medical history, not 
uh, understanding the aesthetic concerns of the patient and where the teeth need to go in the face. And more importantly, it's about function. Because if the bite is off, if the joint is bad, if anything, if there is muscle dysfunction, then we are more likely to have a face in the foundation, or what I like to refer to as your BFF. The things that we haven't traditionally paid enough attention to are the things that cause most of our failures and that increase our risk the most, since we understand biomechanical. Now, one of the ways that I've learned to manage my BFF, or the body, the face, and the foundation, or function, is through cone beam imaging. So this is actually the new Prexion Excelsior unit. That's uh, the last two pictures I'm putting up here, the unit that was installed in my satellite office. And this was put in uh, about, uh, about a year and a half ago now, almost two years. Uh, the reason I chose to put this Prexion unit in is because of the quality of the images. Uh, the low radiation dose, and the very small focal spot, which allows us to get that beautiful image. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other reasons that, that I really love this machine, um, but for the most part, I would not practice dentistry without a comb beam. And for every general practitioner out there, this is an absolute necessity in a general practice now. If you want to do more dentistry, if you want to diagnose more dentistry, you've got to be imaging because we can't diagnose what we don't see. Let's go back to COIS's five diagnostic keys. Again, medical, aesthetics, function, your BFF, the three most important, keeping your eye on that, that's where we're gonna start. So let's start with the body. Uh, some of the red flag medical history findings with the body. So that's the first B. GERD, high blood pressure, diabetes, hypothyroidism, snoring, uh, nocturnal bruxism, anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, nocturia. These are all things that we see on many medical histories, but how much attention do we really pay to that? What are these things telling us? Actually, all of these are common denominators for an airway condition, obstructive sleep apnea. Now, that's been getting a lot of notoriety here lately, and if you are not treating obstructive sleep apnea with oral appliances, that's okay. What I will tell you every general dentist needs to understand is how the airway affects all of the dentistry that you're gonna be diagnosing and that you're gonna be needing to do. Breathing does trump sleep, and you're all looking at the airway immediately when a patient opens their mouth. So I'm gonna tell you that, that uh, airway and treatment of OSA, I understand. It's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to do appliance therapy, but you do need to get the background so you can see how uh, the OSA can cause GERD, which can cause the pitting lesions on your teeth, how OSA can also lead to nocturnal bruxism as part of the arousal process, how it can be causing different types of functional problems. So there are a, a lot of reasons we need to understand airway and just understand that, that, that breathing has to come even before the teeth. And so we do have an obligation to get these patients to their physicians if we suspect a problem in that area. Why? Because we know that as a single predictor for a myocardial infarction, that OSA has one of the highest risks of all of the morbidity factors that we know of. So if we look at the uh, independent predictors of MI, we can see that someone who's overweight has seven times the risk of having an MI. Someone who has high blood pressure has eight times the risk of controls. A smoker has 11 times the risk, but someone with untreated or undiagnosed OSA has almost 23 and a half times the risk of having a heart attack. We can also see that by looking at some of these other medical conditions, uh, that when they exist, that there is a very high likelihood for OSA as well. 
And you can look down this list, drug-resistant hypertension, 83%, heart failure, 76%, atrial fib, 50%. If someone's had a stroke, 92%. All of these conditions are uh, associated with an increased risk of OSA. And the percentages that you see here is the likelihood that someone will have OSA with any one of these given conditions. These are not new studies. Every one of these studies is greater than 10 years old at this point. So uh, if you're not paying attention to this and paying attention to your medical histories, um, then uh, we really need to be doing that. But we also need to be looking at our clinical information, at our data. We're already looking in the mouth, so we can look at malum patty classification. We can see how much vertical space there is in the back of the airway. We can look at the uh, east-west dimension or the lateral dimension of the airway, looking at Samsung Young pharyngeal grading. Again, this is not an OSA course. I just want everyone to be aware that we can be looking in the back of the mouth and basically if there's some space back there for an airway, it's not as concerning as if we look back there and see a condition like uh, number four over there, the, the type four Samsung Young pharyngeal grading, or in the previous picture, the type three or type four Malampati score, and these patients are gonna have a higher risk for having an airway disorder. So we can look back at the throat. We can see visibly obstructed airways. We can see scalloped tongues, which tell us the tongue is too big, the arch is too small, or a combination of the two. These patients are gonna be at higher risk. Or if you do what I do, which is take a cone beam image on just about every single new patient that walks through the door, um, then you're gonna catch many of these patients uh, just by getting a decent image uh, because we have the ability to evaluate the airway and at least screen for a problem with 3D imaging. So we can look at the cross-sectional area, the minimum cross-sectional area, one of the most uh, important numbers to understand. And basically the system is only as good as the smallest point in the airway. So if there is any structure back here, the tongue, tonsils, adenoids, or just the patient's anatomy, uh, adipose tissue, there's a lot of things that can obstruct the pharyngeal airway. But one of the most important dimensions that we can look at is the cross-sectional area, the minimum cross-sectional area at the smallest point in the airway. And that's not just in an AP dimension on a sagittal view like you see here, that is true cross-sectional area looking across all dimensions. So we can also look at the axial view of the pharyngeal airway. Now, again, remembering that this patient is awake, you're already seeing a partial collapse of the airway while the patient is awake and alert and in the cone beam unit. So this patient starts out with a very small airway and the likelihood of having OSA is that much greater because they start out with such a small airway. We can also look at the sagittal airway analysis. Um, so we can look all the way down to the base of C2, all the way from the tongue down to the base of C2. Um, this is actually a Prexion scan and this is using their uh, airway uh, volumetric measuring tool. And so we can see that across this area where it's designated in black, those are all areas that have a small volumetric reading uh, for the size of the airway, meaning that this patient in particular is at higher risk for OSA. Um, the reason that you uh, might wanna take note of this is because this patient happens to be myself. So I had four bicuspid extraction treatment. Uh, my arches are smaller, my airway is smaller to start with, and so I cannot sustain any amount of collapse and I will have OSA. So you can see the multiple areas of constriction that are noted in the pharyngeal airway. On the sagittal view, that was the coronal view that we looked at. We saw it on the axial view. Here's the coronal view with uh, superimposed facial bones, looking at the points of constriction in the airway. 
So just beautiful too, beautiful, beautiful uh, images. What's really cool though, is that with mandibular repositioning, we can also see if there's any improvement to the airway. So this is an image of myself with my Panthera uh, repositioning appliance in my mouth. And you can see the difference between the first picture that I showed you and this picture where volumetric, volumetrically, we've increased uh, the size of the airway to a point where I can breathe much better when I sleep. And it really has made a big difference for me. Remember all this area that was all black? Well, now there's very little black, almost no black on this scan anymore. So um, now my airway is opened uh, tremendously in comparison uh, to where I am without the appliance. So you can also look at this uh, coronal view and we can see a huge difference in the size of the pharyngeal airway. So cool stuff that we can do. Here's the superimposed image. Really cool stuff that we can do um, with the scanner. And this is just in, in the context of airway at this point. We have so much more that we can talk about. The other reason that it's important to be doing these scans is that sometimes people lie. This happens to be my partner. And he said that he didn't snore. He said that he slept well. And, you know, he's one of those people that just checks off all the no boxes. I'm sure lots of you have those patients in your practice that just draw the line through all of the no boxes. Um, and that was him. And I looked at him and said, uh, Marty, uh, you have a problem here. And uh, what Marty said to me was, I don't think I do. And I said, I will bet you $100. And guess who's $100 richer today? But if you look at an airway like this, so looking at that axial view, if you look at an airway like this, and this is the patient awake, it only has to collapse a tiny amount for there not to be enough oxygen passing back and forth. So sometimes people lie and it, it's the cone beam that actually helps us to, uh, to find some of these patients. So this is true of children as well. So I'm a big advocate of uh, taking cone beams on children as well. Why? Because we're going to discover TMJ problems. We're going to discover airway problems in children. We're going to discover problems with the adenoids. We're going to discover problems with the tonsils. We can make arch width measurements from the scan. We can make a lot of skeletal measurements that'll tell us orthopedically and orthodontically where we need to go with this case. So uh, this is a child that you can see has the vacant look to the eyes, crowding. He has a crossbite, dry lips. He's obviously mouth breathing, an open bite. Uh, we call that a long adenoidal face or dolicocephalic. And uh, many, of, uh, many of the conditions he showed up with, mouth breathing, bad tongue posture, bad breath, uh, big tonsils, a forward head posture, dental crowding, high palatal vault, uh, allergies, uh, very nasally voice, wet pillow in the morning, snoring, uh, God forbid, witnessed apneas, maybe even some behavioral issues. You know, we got to do something about these kids, and the scan is going to tell us where the problem may be occurring. And so these kids with crossbites like this and the enlarged tonsils and adenoids, we have the ability to get in there and now uh, do arch expansion, possibly send them for a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Remember what I showed you earlier about being able to see in the back of the throat. Have a little saying that's black is good, pink is bad, red is worse. Meaning that if you can see a lot of black in the back of the airway, it's probably all right. If you only see pink in the back of the airway and don't see that dark pharyngeal space, well, that's bad. But if it also happens to be reddened, that tells you on top of being small, there's a lot of inflammation there. So in this case, you can see that there were enlarged, there's enlarged adenoidal tissue here. There's enlarged tonsillar tissue here. This kid doesn't stand a chance. So we can do arch development. It can be fixed. It can be removable. It doesn't matter how. Um, but we can expand those arches. When we expand the arches in a width-wise dimension, 
we are making the floor of the nasal cavity larger, making the nasal airway larger, and reducing the likelihood for OSA. So in some of those cases, we may eliminate the need for, uh, for a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, and in others, it's just wiser to go ahead and get that done before. Um, but we can take dolicocephalic faces and turn them into brachycephalic faces if we do the right thing. And I was told this was an impossibility in orthodontics, that the mechanics were next to impossible. And uh, my instructors were right, if you didn't pay attention to the airway, it's incredible how children will grow once you take care of the airway. So uh, what I tell a lot of people when you're looking at cone beams, and this is, a, this is another cone beam unit that I was looking at, um, don't get sold on the pretty pictures. Know the data that you're looking for. You need to know the minimum cross-sectional area and you need to know some of the volumetric measurements. Um, but just because it puts forth a pretty picture doesn't mean that it necessarily is telling you anything. So those are the important things. Minimum cross-sectional area and uh, nasopharyngeal volume is also an important measurement as well. Uh, this is actually a study that backs this up that said uh, patients with severe uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome had significantly narrower cross-sectional area at the level of the uvula with expiration, at expiration, excuse me. Uh, more inferiorly positioned hyoid bones and thicker soft palates. Now, these are all things that can be measured with cone beam imaging. Uh, particularly if you are obtaining really good images. So the face, we talked about our BFF, we talked about the body, now let's talk about the face. Uh, my old friend Bob Garrity, who taught me orthodontics, said if it looks good, it's good, and if it looks bad, it's bad. Sounds really stupid, right? Nothing has made more sense in my career than that saying, because if you look at a face and something just doesn't look right, it probably isn't. And so take those little internal messages and do something with it. But the face is not just about cosmetics. The face is also about what it can tell us about function, which is number three as well. So take a look at this face, this young lady. This is a patient of mine. And as you look at her face, um, you can see that her chin is off to the right. You can see she strains to close her lips. You can see that, uh, I mean, you can look at all that muscle tension in, in the chin here. You can tell she's got a really high mandibular plane angle. Uh, looking at the teeth, she's got an open bite. I mean, she's just got every single red flag possible. But this is telling us about function. It's not just telling us about what her face looks like or about what her teeth look like. When I see a bite like this, there's several things going on. First of all, the chin was off to the right. That tells me that we have asymmetric growth of the, uh, of the rami. So the two ramus heights are probably different. There's probably a TMJ injury involved here. The bite is not level, which is also suggestive of a TMJ condition. Um, there's an anterior open bite, which is indicative of a poor tongue posturing, which is typically secondary to an airway issue. And again, you know, we can have these suspicions, but how are we gonna confirm these suspicions? It's with data. It's gonna be with the imaging that we do. So, um, when we talk about the face, we understand that the face can tell us about function. And so that's the BFF, the body, the face, and function. So what does function mean? When we talk about function, I like to break this into something called the functional triad. And the functional triad means that function is not just about how the teeth fit together. It's about the face, which can tell us if there's a joint problem, it's about the skeletal pattern, which can tell us about a potential airway problem. It's about the bite, which can tell us about a potential bite problem and can tell us about a potential airway problem. And it's about the joint, 
which will now dictate what the occlusion is going to look like or how the occlusion is going to fare. So um, pretty, pretty tricky topic. Uh, to cover in one hour. I will tell you, I will be speaking on this at the uh, seminar in Nashville uh, that's coming up in a few weeks. I also talk about this in our continuum. If you're interested at all, I'll put that information up again at the end. Um, but it's, it's important to understand that function is not just about the bite. Function is not just about the joint. Function is about how all of these things fit together and how they all have to work in harmony. And so we are obliged to take note of what we see on these scans and then look at how that impacts function, understanding that function is one of the biggest risk factors for our restorative care. And it's one of the reasons that our restorative care fails uh, so often when we can't explain why it failed otherwise. So um, again, the, the airway and the face talks about the skeletal pattern. That talks about uh, what the airway is like. It talks about uh, the likelihood that there's going to be a bite problem. Uh, from that, we can learn about uh, the possibility of a potential joint problem. We know that with either a joint problem or with an occlusion problem, we can have a muscle problem. So um, again, these things all are interacting all the time and please just appreciate that function is not only one of these things, but it's how all three will interact. So what does the face tell us? Well, when we combine it, with what we see in the true occlusion. And we now combine that with what we can find with cone beam imaging and the skeletal measurements that we are able to make. Now, again, we can make determinations as to the health of the joint. We can measure the ramus height on both sides, um, wanting them both to be with certainly within a few millimeters of each other. Um, if there's been any condylar head damage or any type of joint injury, we'll see those heights different. Uh, we will also see the mandible go off to one side. And so we'll see the molar classification different on both sides. We can make observations on the airway at the same time. Uh, and then we can look at the condylar heads. So we can make a really good assessment about the joint. So why is it that a problem with the joint is going to manifest in the teeth? Why is it that a problem in the joint is going to manifest with a chin that's deviated to one side? Why is it going to mean that the muscles are uh, going to be in spasm? Why does it mean that there's going to be a malocclusion uh, when we have an issue with the joint? And it's very simple. It's a concept that's just not taught in dental school. And that is, is that all of these structures are connected. So if you think about this, this is going to be your 30-second anatomy lesson here. We have a condylar head that has a meniscus that is firmly attached to it and held in place by collateral ligaments in this area here. So when the condyle travels, so remember first it rotates, then it translates. When that condyle uh, translates, this disc should be traveling with it anywhere that it goes. If the condyle comes forward, then the disc should come forward. If the condyle comes down, then the disc is gonna come down because of those collateral ligaments. But what if there's an injury to those collateral ligaments or a disc that's out of place? Now, this uh, condyle can go up higher. And guess what? The condyle is attached to the ramus, which is attached to the body of the mandible, which is attached to the alveolus, which is attached to the teeth. And so if this goes back and up, these teeth go back and up. If this comes down and forward, these teeth come down and forward. So anything that happens here is going to manifest here. And it's why we need to be looking at these scans before we start doing orthodontic treatment or before we start making a diagnosis where we start cutting on teeth 
or changing the dentition when it's very possible that the original problem is back in the foundation here or a problem with their function. I'm just trying to open your eyes to this. I'm not gonna make an expert in a one hour presentation. But we can take a good sagittal look. We can look at the positioning of the condyle. We can also look at the health of the condyle. We can look at the health of the cortical plate. We can look at the round shape versus having osteophytic change. We can look for degenerative changes. We can look for a positioning problem or a problem where there's not enough space for the meniscus to even exist. These are the kind of images that we're getting with the Prexion, and it is absolutely gorgeous. We can also look at the quality of the bone. So you can see these radiolucent areas within the bone as areas of pressure in this coronal view. Look at this gorgeous view we also get of the cervical spine. So we can look, look for atlas and axis mal rotations, and we can look for misalignments, and we can work together with our cervical spine specialists, our chiropractors, to help get the muscles in harmony, which are going to have an effect on our bite. But if you look at the sagittal view here, and I have blown, look how big I've blown this up. And you can see there's absolutely no room for the disc. This condylar head is completely flattened. You can see that there's no discal space here. This space should be at least 1.8 millimeters, and that's just way too small. And you can see that because of the bony pressure that's being exerted, again, bone on bone, we're starting to get degenerative change to the bone. And so we're not seeing a, uh, a uniformly dense bone in the condylar head here. And so that is really a cause for alarm. This is a disc that's out of place. Uh, we may possibly not be getting enough blood and nutrients uh, to the condylar head. And as a result of that, we can see a condition called avascular necrosis, where the bone begins to die. And uh, I actually fear that for the patient that you were just looking at. So um, I show those images uh, because, uh, particularly the cervical spine, uh, because of our ability to get that. So the machine that you see on the right-hand side is my original ICAP machine. I bought that machine more than uh, 10 years ago. It's about 11 years old now. Um, and it was great at the time. I spent $200,000 to put that machine in my first office. Um, yep, that's quite a lick. I mean, you can get into most cone beam imaging now for less than half of that. And, and have a much better image, like with the Prexion that you see to the left, the Excelsior that you see on the left side. That's what I put into my satellite office. Um, but there's a lot of other advantages. So when we talk about things like looking at the cervical spine and looking at head tilts and cants, do you think it would be easier for a patient to have perfect, perfect vertical alignment in a machine that allows you to stand up or sit down and not entrap you within this gantry uh, because very often in this machine we end up with neck tilts, head tilts, which are going to affect what you see on the airway, what you are going to see um, in the cervical spine, and even in the TMJs if there's enough of a head tilt or a head camp. Uh, quite typically patients with short necks or uh, stout uh, features are gonna have a harder time in the ICAT or in any of these sit down units. And we've had so many cases where the gantry would just get stuck on patients uh, with the ICAT. In fact, we started sending all of our larger patients down uh, to the other office where they could get the Prexion scan. Uh, I can also tell you that from a claustrophobia perspective, I'd rather get into the machine that you see on your left as well not to mention uh, that we also just get a better quality image from that machine because of the size of the focal spot. So some of the things you can look for as far as the joint goes, uh, these are some of the adolescent facial patterns associated with TMJ. And yes, this is a condition very commonly associated in adolescents. 
which is why no child should ever have orthodontics without a cone beam image. I am absolutely adamant about that uh, because I can't tell you the number of class two cases I've seen corrected that were actually class two because of a joint injury and the teeth were moved to correct the class two, the joint was left in the wrong position and uh, basically the whole thing becomes an adult TMJ fiasco. These are the cases I treat every day. So uh, retronathic mandibles, steep mandibular plane angles, short ramus heights, midline asymmetry, lip incompetencies, increased lower facial height, and forward head posture. So uh, there's the citation uh, for all of that information that I'm showing you. So let's take this to the next level then. So if we talk about the triad of function, if we talk about, remember, the skeleton, and the face and the occlusion, and we take into consideration the joint, from a risk management perspective, here is how we're going to look at this. So the face, the skeletal pattern, the occlusion are all going to be part of my diagnosis. And again, I get a lot of information on that directly from my cone beam imaging. So if I look at the face, if I look at the cone beam and, and some of the facial measurements, and I look at the occlusion and some of the occlusal, occlusal measurements from the cone beam, this is going to be my diagnosis. But the joint, that's really gonna be my prognosis because if this is stable and the teeth fit together correctly, the restorative case is gonna be stable. If this is not stable, disc out of place, degenerative change, disc, you know, completely dislocated, if this is not stable, then the bite cannot remain stable because as this changes, the bite changes. Just a new way of thinking about dentistry, a new way of thinking about risk management. So the body, the face, the foundation or, or function, this is the key to why so many cases are failing restoratively. So hopefully I've opened your mind to some of these things. Uh, we're gonna get to Q&A in just a few minutes. I've only got a few more slides to wrap up. Uh, but you can see all of the images that I take with, with my cone beam, uh, with my Prexion Excelsior, I'm typically gonna get a full scan. Uh, now, they also have an increased size of 15 by 15 that's offered now, um, but even with this 15 by 8, I can get almost all of the structures that I need to be looking at the joints, to be looking at the airway, to be looking at the teeth, to be looking at endodontic problems, to be looking at periodontal problems, to be looking at the cervical spine, to be looking at impacted wisdom teeth, to be looking at the sinuses. Am I making sense to everybody? You don't know what you're not seeing until you start seeing it. And you cannot diagnose what you don't see. So look at how crisp and gorgeous. You can go to smaller fields of view if all you're interested in is the implants and the teeth. But I'll tell you, your conversion rate for implants, if you know whether a patient has the room and the space and you can show them where the implant goes, your conversion rate on implant cases goes up immediately. My $200,000 comb beam paid for itself almost immediately in implant cases that we started doing. Forget about all the TMJ and the airway and all of the other conditions that we were finding. Why Prexion? Because of the focal spot size, because of the quality of the image. Most typical comb beam units have a focal spot of about 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters, okay? So when we talk about focal spot, we're talking about the source from the camera. How small is the focal spot? And then how small is the voxel size? They have to match up. And so a 0.5 millimeter focal spot would give you an image that looks like the one on the right here. But if like Prexion, you have a smaller focal spot, and by the way, this is smaller than most of the intraoral heads that you're using in your operatories, then with the same amount of radiation, you're going to get an image that gives you that type of clarity on the left. So it really is kind of a no-brainer. And again, these are all the areas that we can 
use cone beam imaging. It, it just fits in in everything that we do. Um, I don't have a lot of time to really go over this. Um, I will share this with you. You can download it and copy it from catapulteducation.com. Uh, one of the most common objections I hear to scanning is people say, oh my gosh, the radiation, the radiation. And I can show you where I'm taking a scan on a patient, no intraoral x-rays typically, because of the quality of the scan. I don't need bite wing x-rays in a lot of cases. I can look at an axial view of my scan. I can also use my uh, carry view. I can use uh, diagnodent. I can use all my other transillumination. I can use all of these other caries detection aids. So if I only take a scan on uh, every new patient, I can do more accurate diagnosis when the kid needs uh, when the kid needs orthodontics. I don't need to do another Panorex. I don't need to do a separate picture of the joints. I don't need to do a separate picture of the airway. I'm getting it all in one, and so uh, I can show you with these radiation levels that I am actually exposing my patients to less radiation over the long term than most dentists who are taking full mouth series or panoramics and bite wings every uh, three years and, and bite wings every year. So this is the young lady I showed you. That was her orthodontic finish. That was the best I could do given her airway problem and her joint problem. She's actually now having, uh, getting ready to have joint surgery. Um, and I will conclude the lecture with this comment uh, about the body, face, and foundation, is that you always have to remember your BFFs. This is what's messing your cases up, the ones that you can't explain why they went bad, the anterior teeth that are cracking after you do veneers, uh, you know, the, the teeth that are moving, the midlines that are opening, the orthodontic instabilities. It's because we're not paying attention to the body the face and the foundation or function. These are my BFFs, these are uh, my sons, Luke and Joel, and uh, that's my wife, and that's my dog, Marilyn, in Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. And uh, with that, um, I wanted to put this last slide up again about Nashville. If anyone is interested, we have all these other terrific catapult speakers. Again, if you put this uh, code Horowitz in, you'll get $60 off. I uh, know it's only a couple of weeks away, but I love making decisions like that. What, uh, what better place to go than Nashville? It's absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you there. So you can go to catapulteducation.com. And I will leave you with, uh, with this last thought, which is your beliefs don't make you a better person. Your behavior does. So with that, I'd like to thank Catapult Education. I'd especially like to thank Prexion for sponsoring this lecture and for their wonderful customer service and, uh, and imaging quality. And uh, with that, uh, my email is on the bottom right and I'd like to open it up to any questions. Uh, so great question uh, about, uh, I have uh, someone on who say they have the Cavo 3D and they're thinking to switch to a larger field for sleep studies and ortho. Um, I'd say if you can get a 15 by 15, that is uh, really, that'll give you everything you need. On, on many people, I can use a 15 by 13. You saw how much I got even in that 15 by eight view. Um, so we'll take a scout image and, and I'm always gonna use the smallest field of view to keep my radiation levels um, to the most reasonable. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, Prexion, as I said, now has the 15 by 15 um, view that's available. So um, anyway, I would look into all of those. Um, and how did I put together such a great system? Oh, that's from my good friend, Hugh Flax. And uh, Hugh, uh, where would I start as far as putting together a system? I assume that what you're, what you're mentioning is uh, the, the system of body, face, and foundation. Um, the, the place to start with that is education, of course. Um, a lot of the foundations for what I do uh, came from the Koi Center, came from what I learned uh, through Mark Piper and through orthodontics. 
So I, I'd strongly recommend education, and that's one of the things that Catapult Education takes very seriously, and it's one of the reasons that we're putting together a uh, a continuum at a at a lower fee. Uh, because we're going to be working with some of these great sponsors. They're going to help offset the cost of education. So um, I would say the best place to start, come out to our symposium, listen to all the great speakers that we have. Um, people like, uh, like Hugh Flax that are just absolutely amazing when it comes to cosmetic dentistry. And uh, we have implant speakers. We, we have people going to be talking about every single topic. And so that'll give you some insight into the continuum that we're going to be doing. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot to think about here, um, and and I understand, uh, you know, that that was not a, a, not a course for beginners, but really the idea here was was really to open your eyes to all the things that you've not been seeing. Yen, I didn't expect to make an expert in one hour. I just want you to realize that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, and until it's really put in front of us, until we have the data to back up what we don't know, um, then, then I tell you, um, you know, it, 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 we're missing something. And, and I think we owe it to our patients to provide that kind of comprehensive uh, therapy. So um, also uh, there's another question about training. Um, again, I can't really speak uh, for many of the other companies. What I do know is that uh, Prexion has an amazing customer service department. They're very dedicated to education. Uh, I received way more training from Prexion than I did from, uh, from the iCat company when, when I uh, purchased that one. So uh, anyway, um, I wish you all a very, very happy Passover or Easter or uh, anything that you celebrate. And uh, I really appreciate all of you listening in and uh, all of the kind comments. So have a, have a great rest of the week and a, and a wonderful holiday weekend.